There are two words that haunt me. Xenon poisoning. The myth surrounding it has permeated the story of Chernobyl, completely changing the events on their head. It appears everywhere, from Wikipedia to lectures by MIT, from documentaries and books to YouTube videos, and of course, the creme de la creme of making Chernobyl mistakes the HBO miniseries. How can so many people get it so wrong? And how can all of this be disproven by one man with one graph? Let's find out. First of all, what is the xenon poisoning myth? Or, better question, what is xenon poisoning to begin with? For those who are unaware, xenon-135 is a byproduct of nuclear fission but mostly comes from the decay of another byproduct, tellurium-135 into iodine-135, and then into xenon-135. Both iodine and xenon isotopes are neutron absorbers, with iodine-135 being a weak absorber, and xenon-135 being the strongest known neutron absorber discovered. These then absorb neutrons and effectively remove both the neutrons and the isotopes from the equation, bringing the rate of fission down. To compensate, operators typically remove control rods, reducing the number of neutrons absorbed by them. This allows the reactor to reach an equilibrium, where the rate of neutron absorbers capturing neutrons and being removed from the equation equals the amount of neutron absorbers being produced. As HBO's Valery Legasov calls it, it's an invisible dance, and it's beautiful. Unfortunately, he doesn't understand it. Not properly, anyway. We're going to stick with the HBO description for a while, as it explains the xenon poisoning myth in probably the most coherent way for people not very familiar with the intricacies of RBMK operation. It's great for these simplified explanations. Just a shame it can't get the science right. Anyway, the story of the myth goes as follows. The RBMK is prepared for the rundown experiment at 2pm. When, right as they're about to do it, there is a demand to delay the shutdown. HBO blames this on increased demands due to workers trying to meet productivity quotas. In reality, another nuclear power plant had unexpectedly scrammed. This is the crux of the myth. The delay led to an increase in xenon poisoning, continuing to build up through the rest of the day and into the night, until the night shift came along and they began to reduce the power. At this point, xenon poisoning rears its ugly head, pulling the reactor power down further and further. In their attempts to stabilise the power, they instead plummet down to 30 megawatts. They then raise the power, pulling out almost all the control rods to their limits, and only end up being able to stabilise at 200 megawatts due to the high xenon poisoning. It's a simple myth that makes perfect sense, until you critically analyse it. So, let's do that. Before we look at this myth, let's have a quick gander and find out where the story comes from. It seems that the genesis of this myth dates back to 1986 from the Soviets. As it turns out, the Soviet scientists were desperate to shift the blame of the power drop to anything other than a mechanical or reactor coefficient issue, and thrust it onto the operators. Another example of something they invented to create this power drop is Toptonov accidentally forgetting to set a value for the automatic regulators to hold the power at, which then defaults to a power of zero. Not only is this not what happened, but also completely impossible due to the way the automatic regulators work. An accurate description of what actually happened can be found in INSAG 7. Although it is quite complicated. Okay, so, first problem with the myth. Why would Xenon build up in the reactor? Reactor power is held at half power for more than 18 hours and the half-life of iodine-135, before it beta decays into xenon, is a little under 7 hours. In that time, a little over 2.5 half-lives have passed for iodine produced 
to have decayed into Xenon 135 and then be burned off, or just under 85% of it. At the same time, iodine-135 is also capturing neutrons to become iodine-136, which beta decays with a half-life of less than 90 seconds into xenon-136, the same isotope formed when xenon-135 captures a neutron, which has a half-life of 2.18 sextillion years. Secondly, why does xenon behave so strangely in the myth? Let's not talk physics, let's talk logic here. Assume that Xenon builds up, poisoning the core, until the sudden drop to 30 megawatts. Well, at this point, Xenon is going to skyrocket. If they can't stabilise the power at 700 megawatts, why would they be able to raise the power at 30 megawatts? Surely that's impossible. Nope, they can do that. But meanwhile, Xenon is going to increase due to the obvious decrease in power from 1600 megawatts down to 30 and then back to 200. If they have all the rods out to compensate for Xenon, then surely they would eventually run out of rods to extract and the Xenon would cause another scram. Except no, it magically becomes obsolete and stops having a negative effect on power. Furthermore, we have evidence to support this myth is false, coming directly from INSAG 7 the official report on the accident by the International Atomic Energy Agency. On page 117, we find this graph, showing that the control rod insertion increased throughout April 25th, 1986. In other words, it was compensating for the burning off of xenon and iodine by inserting control rods. Now, you may think that all of this at the end of the day is just speculation but allow me to introduce you to Viktor Dmitriev, the man behind the website Accident.ru. Before we do anything else, we need to assess the source of this information. Is Dmitriev qualified to talk on this subject? I'd say yes. Between 1979 and 1989, Dmitriev worked as head of the reactor department for the All Union Research Institute for Operation of Nuclear Power Plants literally from the year it was founded. Within days of the disaster, he was investigating the causes of the accident and identified many key factors, including the positive scram effect, as well as dynamic modeling of the reactor in those final few hours, minutes, and seconds before disaster. All of this work was classified and buried by the Soviet government only to be dragged out years later for INSAG-7 and other modern-day analyses. I'd agree he's more than qualified for this. On his website, Dmitriev actually gives us the equations for calculating xenon poisoning during dynamic changes in power. After speaking with multiple nuclear physicists to confirm these are indeed the genuine equations, I then looked for where these equations were turned into a visible image. The dynamic changes in reactor power were recorded, and all we have to do is plug the numbers into the Xenon equation. In fact, we can do that for multiple scenarios, which is exactly what Dmitriev did. And when you do, you get this. Okay, this graph looks like information overload, so I'm going to break it down for you as simply as possible. The red line is the Xenon poisoning that occurred in real life. The lower the line, the greater the xenon poisoning. The peak xenon poisoning is as early as 8am on April 25th, and after that it gradually begins to recover until just before midnight. At that point, reactor power is reduced to 760 megawatts, and then continuing down and down to 30 megawatts, and then back up to 200. At the moment of the explosion, the amount of negative reactivity inserted into the core is at most half of what it was at the peak on April 25th, and at the time of the power drop, it was at the same level as midnight the day before. In other words, Xenon was certainly not causing any significant poisoning to the core. This is something Dmitriev agrees with. I also want to draw your attention to the red circles along the graph. This is the operating reactivity margin, the effective number of control rods in the core, at that exact time. 
there are some things to note here. First, the first circle does not include automatic control rods. It should be higher. Second, the last circle is the ORM at 122.30, when the feed water flow was spiking to increase the water level in the steam separators. This introduction of cooler feed water collapsed voids in the core, requiring control rods to be extracted to compensate. When the feed water flow was reduced, control rods were inserted shortly after again, as the coolant again began to boil. Let's also mention the calculations by former Deputy Chief Engineer of the Nuclear Safety Department, Nikolai Karpan, which has shown that the xenon buildup actually was only equal to one to two control rods being extracted. Given the operating reactivity margin was around 20 at 1am and they lost two, that's 18, above the limit of 15 control rods in the core. Clearly, something else is to blame. And that's the point of the graph. Xenon is not to blame. As you can see, the xenon doesn't correlate to the control rod extraction. What it does correlate to is other factors. For example, the reduction in boiling in the core to spikes in feed water and the activation of additional main circulation pumps. These are necessary for the experiment. For comparison, the brown line shows what would happen if they immediately reduced to 200 megawatts on the morning of April 25th, instead of holding at 1600 megawatts for turbine testing. As you can see, the xenon poisoning is incredible and could have potentially caused a violation of the operating reactivity margin to hold the power before the experiment could begin. The pink line shows the same thing as the brown line, but in this hypothetical, they hold the power at 700 megawatts instead. And finally, the fourth line shows the same power transitions, but instead of gradual increases or decreases, the changes are instantaneous. What this shows is that, overall, the xenon poisoning on April 26 was about as low as it could be for the situation they were in. The myth of the xenon poisoning is another attempt to blame the operators for the accident, a weaponization of the general public's lack of knowledge on the subject to force a narrative of operator incompetence. By making it appear that xenon is accumulating and the operators ignore the danger, you've created operator incompetence where there was none. And then other scientists trusting the information from the Soviet scientists before them, repeat it in lectures, continuing the cycle of misinformation. That's how these myths and legends are spread.